described as one of the finest artists of his generation, our special guest today has set the stages ablaze all over the world for the past three decades. As a dancer, he holds audiences spellbound with his ability to draw them into his performance. As a teacher, he has nurtured some of the brightest international artists. As a pioneer, he is recognized internationally as a cultural icon and a dynamic force in the arts scene. In 2012, he was acknowledged as the living heritage by the Malaysian government. And in the same year, the United Nations declared him to be a UNESCO living treasure for his contribution to cultural heritage. So today, we are indeed honored to welcome a living legend, a master of the Indian classical dance. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the artistic director and chairman of the Sutra Dance Theatre, Dr. Ramli Ibrahim. Thank you and a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much to Suchi Foundation for having me and Mei Mei to share our art with all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, maybe I will start with my own background. I am a Malay um, in an art form that is different. It is an Indian classical dance form which has a very strong connection with temples. It is known to be of divine origin. The origin of the dance, the Adiguru of the dance is Shiva Raja Nataraja. Now my own background is I have a strong uh, background in Malay traditional dance originally. I also went to Indian classical dance much later, but I was also trained in ballet. I was a product of the Australian Ballet School, uh, which is the National School for Australia, where they also teach modern dance. And therefore, I have kind of one foot on tradition and the other, uh, the other foot also on what I call the contemporary modern uh, values and aesthetics. So I have both of the modern and the traditional side by side, just like most of us here. I was also in my childhood brought in my primary school at the Pasarot Malay School, so I did not learn English as my uh, first language. It was Malay, and therefore I read Jawi. And uh, then I was able to go to the Royal Military College and after that matriculation at, in Australia where I continued to the University of Western Australia to do my degree in mechanical engineering. So there you are, you have someone who went through, but I think at the back of my mind, because as a child I was already uh, new that I have a very strong artistic calling. And eventually, when I was more aware, when I was more conscious, I kind of follow my destiny, my bliss, so to speak, my calling. And it has been said by the great dancer Martha Graham that the dance or the art don't you don't choose the arts, you don't choose dance, but the dance had chosen you as the vehicle. So we always feel that you are a subset of a larger tradition, which is the dance, rather than you want to exert your kind of um, hyper-individuality. No, I feel that even uh, in uh, being a modern, uh, individual, I felt that this idea of being a vehicle for a larger calling has always been there with me. Our next um, topic that I want to 
talk straight on to the aesthetics of Indian dance is I want to clear some of the terminology that beset us in as dancers. These are the idea of what is traditional, what is modern, what is contemporary. When I talk of traditional, I feel that we have to talk about the calling of the collective. When you talk about tradition, the collective has agreed that this is what they are following or they're looking of, uh, for. And when we talk about modernity, um, we're talking about more individual precept or individual point of view. And uh, when you talk about modern, say, visual artists, the f one of the first person that you think of is Picasso. So he breaks through of that. But don't forget, there is also the tradition. Um, a lot of the uh, religions uh, are from the tradition. A lot of paintings or music form a tradition of the collective. So the aesthetics abide to that traditional value. But I also feel that when you talk of contemporary, I feel that we are talking about the present. Um, so especially in countries like India or China or Malaysia, a lot of the artists who are doing traditional works, new traditional works, they are also saying that I am in the present, I am doing contemporary traditional, or uh, later on, the, a lot of the modern dances, they are doing contemporary modern dances. Sometimes we must not define ourselves from only from the point of the, of the West, but also uh, with regard to the milieu or the, the, the position we are in. The next one I want to talk about, uh, the traditional dance, for instance. Um, in traditional dance, we, we are looking at uh, uh, three, at least three major traditional dances. We are looking at tribal dance, we look at folk dance, and we look at classical or court dances. In tribal dance, uh, folk dance, and uh, classical or court dances, you find that society have evolved. Society has become more and more sophisticated. And you can find that in tribal dance, uh, the movement is simpler, maybe one uh, di uh, dim dimensional, uh, maybe just a simple, say, tri uh, tribal dance, for example. Yeah. Very simple. Uh, it's it's the, the space... Uh, uh, the space uh, um, preoccupation is is smaller, you know, and in folk dance maybe you know because of the agricultural or whatever it is is about that, and so it's bigger. Maybe just a little bit of a folk dance. Uh, yeah, maybe a cutting. I mean, yeah, cutting of something that comes out in dance. Yeah. Um, Let's, uh, let's do something in, in, in classical dance where it's more stylized. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do that. That's what we did just now, for example, taki da da. So it's more, yep. Taki ta da kirtak tam ta hi te taki ta da kirtak tam. So the, the geometric pattern is more uh, rigid and more kind of, well, I don't want to say rigid, it's much more clear and uh, the stylization in terms of uh, description. Like say, for example, the, 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 um, um, uh, the Shiva pose, for example. Uh, do another Shiva pose, uh, maybe. Maybe in Odyssey, uh, holding... Uh, the skull, for example. Yeah, so uh, the, that dance has got the metaphor, uh, Shiva holding the skull. Uh, well, you have to know the story of that. And, and it is then, thank you, uh, Mimi, it, that's, that is when you say that for those, for the devotee who knows the, the, the hidden meanings be, be, beside the symbols, then pain and suffering 
he or she has not. We are more interested in classical dance at the moment because uh, Sutra, where I am a chairman of the Sutra Foundation, we deal in Bharatanatyam and Odissi, which are the two Indian classical dances in, uh, that we teach. So when we talk about classical, why are they cl uh, called classical? You know, of course, there are hundreds and thousands of folk dances and also tribal dances, uh, not just in Malaysia, but also in India or in China. So one of the reasons why there are only eight classical dance form of India is because one is there are very Sanskritized. Sanskrit is the classical language of, uh, of uh, uh, medieval or ancient India. So a lot of the works that uh, you see in the eight classical Indian dance styles all over India, only eight. Uh, they are heavily sans Sanskritized. Um, and they're very stylized. So show me a picking of flowers. Um, so that, that is the stylization. So the flowers, the maiden pick the flowers and smell it and picking up. So it's, it's quite stylized. Show me flower, for example. Yeah, the lotus and the bee. Yeah. All that is stylized. So the classical form, uh, most of the eight classical forms has this stylization. Second is this very important uh, compendium or um, shastra. The word, the Malay word shastra is also of Sanskrit origin. The Natya Shastra, which was compiled between the second and fifth century AD uh, has everything, and uh, I think Ms. Wong was telling me in one of my talks, I mentioned that in the Natya Shastra, it already says that there is no axiom, no concept in the universe that cannot be expressed in dance. So, and also in the Natya Shastra, it explains that in the relationship between you and uh, the performer or Meme is how much rasa, how much emotional feeling that you can feel when you see the work. And this can be explained in, say, when you see Chinese opera, or you, you can see Arja of Bali, or you can see the Mak Yong. It's, it is this. And you, you can explain in paintings or music, this feeling, this flavor, the word rasa, as you all know, uh, Malay word uh, rasa also describes food, uh, yeah? Uh, panas or, or pedas or uh, um, you know, it's sweet or things like that. So, um, and also the content, the content takes on the great epics of the Ramayana or, or the Mahabharata, but also from the Puranas. The Puranas are the, the works describing the origins of the gods, and then it de describes the myth of origins. Yeah? So that's very important because a lot of the tradition must know who, what, and what, wh where did they come from. So the dance then has all these criterions uh, that you, you can... In. I think the last one we also hear is that the dance also have become an offering of the best of yourself to the best that you think of, and which is metaphorized as to be the God. And that's why the dance have got uh, a, a divine origin, and they are uh, uh, used uh, just like flowers, music, things that you money cannot buy as offerings to, the, uh, to divinity. I mentioned that India recognized eight classical dance form, and they're all over India. Now, the first one is Bharatanatyam, which we also uh, teach and perform. The Bharatanatyam is from Tamil Nadu, uh, from south, from the south, and uh, you can see that the, the costumes has a lot of gold in it, and uh, it has a very sharp movement. The second dance is the Katakali, which is, uh, as Bharatanatyam is a solo form, the solo dance that takes many characters, the Katakali is a dance drama form, just like Chinese opera. It is, uh, you know, uh, it describes uh, uh, a narrative uh, that comes in, and there's only one character. And in this case, perhaps it's Krishna, or it is Arjuna, you know. Uh, it is, uh, you know, so the dancer don't take as many characters as in the solo form. And Katakali is a dance drama form from 
from the Kerala. Mohini Attam is the female uh, counterpart of Kerala. Uh, it is a more or less a solo form. You notice that the, the bun is on one side of the head and uh, they wear this sari that is strictly from Kerala. The third is the Odyssey, and this is an old picture of me when I was younger. You can find that the Benga Patia, which we, we did not uh, wear a full costume, as this is a demonstration. It is mainly the jewellery is in silver, and one of the great uh, characteristic of Odyssey is the three bangi, the three bands. Meme, can you just do? Yeah. So the, the three bands of the head, the torso, and the hip, and it's really looked like a temple sculpture coming to life. The next one is the Kuchipudi, which is in Andhra, between Odessa, and Bharatanatyam, so it has also the three bangi. Uh, so, you know, though the music, the music, as I said that, the music are different, the music still belong to the uh, Karnatic or the South system. As you might know that there might there are two major systems, uh, the, the Northern and the South, the Hindustani and the Carnatic music, whereas the Orissa also say that the music system is different. As you know, India is a continent just as, uh, say, China is or, or Russia is a big continent. So people are, you know, within 300 uh, kilometers, uh, different people living uh, that are possibly uh, cannot understand each other's language. The next one is the, um, let me see, the Kathak. The Kathak has a strong Muslim inf influence. The Kathak is also a solo form and it has the Mughal influence. There's a lot of pirouettes, a lot of what they call the Brahmari and the Chakra, uh, uh, chakra uh, from there. And, you see that it is the Kathak that has uh, gone uh, to to uh, uh, the Mediterranean as flamenco, actually. So there is a big connection between Kathak and the flamenco. The next one, and there is the Manipuri, which is also a dance drama from Manipur, which is in the northeastern part of India. And the last uh, one is the Satriya dance, which is just recently... Uh, um, recognized as a classical form. I am part of a tradition when I do Indian classical dance, though a lot of the work that we do are commissioned uh, uh, in Orissa, which means that we own the work in the music also. But I think in traditional uh, um, dances, the inspiration is always nature. You cannot uh, get away from nature. So everything, the movement, the flowers, and all that kind of thing reverts back uh, nature, uh, to nature. And I think they, they do say that nature is the, the highest guru in this kind of thing. It's also an inspiration for, for tradition. But whereas I think in contemporary work, when I do choreography or contemporary work, then anything can be an inspiration. A painting can be an uh, uh, inspiration. Music can be inspiration. People, of course, have always been inspirational. Mm -hmm. And I think a choreographer has to be very observant, very interested in people because he is a voyeur who actually notes down, oh, this, this is how, and, and it comes out. As a as a work uh, as a work of art, uh, hopefully, uh, when a, w a work is created. The last one I wanted to talk about Malaysia is one of the most diverse uh, countries in Southeast Asia. So it's not something unusual that here I, I am a Malay and here is Tan Mei Mei, a Chinese dancing. We actually find that it's a it is a privilege for us to be there. The question whether I'm a Malay or what a Chinese girl doing uh, India doing Indian dance doesn't come to, uh, around at all. And I have many, many very good Chinese dancers who have made it. Uh, well, I mean, who who are recognised in even in India itself as good Chinese. Uh, uh, Indian dancers, and uh, you know now you can find Korean or Japanese or or, or Russians who do Indian dance. As uh, you know, I think I believe I, uh, there are Iranians doing uh, Chinese opera and all those kind of things. So the world now is 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 uh, it's globalized, uh, and so it's not. Uh, you have to look at the diversity that we have as a resource, not as a problem. It will become a problem if you think it's a problem. 
and um, I think uh, this is in a way sufficient for you to have a look at uh, the the Indian classical dance in a different kind of eye so that you are able to uh, uh, to appreciate it a bit more. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here once again and uh, I thank all of you for having me here on behalf of Mamie and also Wei Jin. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Nato Ramli and Sis Tan Mei Mei for the inspiring and insightful sharing into the aesthetics of the classical Indian dance. Truly, art can act as a force to harmonize the society, especially in a multiracial country like Malaysia, and to also promote peace through the appreciation of each other's culture and tradition.